Pat Bular. Beautiful. Huh? On the 11th of September, the St. Louis Cardinals were two games over 500. They were behind half the league, it felt like, in the wild card race. So as far as strategies go, win out is a pretty good one. 17 straight <laughs> to clinch wild card number two. But now next Wednesday, whoever doesn't win the West, either the best team in baseball, the Giants, or the defending champion Dodgers, be up against the Cardinals in that one game playoff. But yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery. Today is a gift, which is why we call it the present, Ramon and Shelburne. What are we witnessing with these St. Louis Cardinals? Uh, they are winning every which way. I mean, six yeah. of these wins have come when they were down by multiple runs. Eight have been on the road. You have Adam Wainwright out there who's 40 years old with an 89-mile-an-hour fastball just dealing like it was a decade ago. I mean, this team is winning all sorts of ways, and I, I, I will be there next Wednesday if it's the Dodgers and the Cardinals. Again, like a decade ago when they used to play in the playoffs all the time. I, I, I can't believe one of those teams is going to be out in that wild card. Exactly, right? I mean, it <laughs> <laughs> Going into a one-off is the advantage oh. with the team that has won 17, and this could be, what, 23 straight by the time we get there? Or is the advantage with the defending champs, Ramona? Just give me a little tease of that. I think it'll be with the defending champs because they have their pick of three aces here. But Adam Wainwright's going to have all this, the rest of the season to sit and wait and line up for that wild card game because they're clinched, whereas the Dodgers have to play it out and try to catch the Giants for the NL West title. Israel, I'll bring you in here, and it's, it would be 22 straight if the Cardinals go into the postseason having won out. But does that make them a favorite? I mean, if you never lose for the last month of the year, are you the favorite going into the postseason? <laughs> Well, for starters, Ramona, if you win 17 in a row, you're going to have to find different ways to do that. You're not going to do it the same way every time. <laughs> um, and I will say, though, while it does, you are working toward a one-game situation. But when you are the team late in the season that has sort of been on the run, and this is a spectacular run, obviously, then you sort of have that way to win. You have that edge, even in a one-game situation. And you can go through the history of baseball and look at the hottest teams going down the last, you know, two, even three-month long stretches, and they end up following suit and winning in the playoffs. So and from that respect, I know it's going into a one-game situation, but hey, they've done it all season long. They can continue to do it for that one game. And when you get there, with, if they get there with a 22-game streak, which is going to be pretty impossible but uh seemingly impossible but you're gonna feel like you can win every game so that does give you but you just said they've done it all season long they didn't do it all season long they were basically a 500 <laughs> team i'll bring in justin tinsley here what are we witnessing with these cardinals and will it carry over look 17 straight at any point in the season is incredible 17 straight after september 1st we haven't seen that in 86 years now imagine being the giants or the dodgers you win 100 plus games, you probably feel like you, you probably feel like you're on a punked episode. Like where's Ashton Kutcher? Like we do all this and we get the hottest team in baseball that's literally clicking everywhere. Wayne Wright is 4-0 in September. He's 10 and 1 in his last 11 and they're top 3 in runs per game, OPS, home run and run differential. This team is I haven't seen anything like this. And the funny thing about this Cardinals team, this is the second time a Cardinals team ha has come back from as far as nine games back to win the wild card. The last time they did that was 2011, and they happened to win the World All Series. All right. Pablo Torre, I'll bring you in here on what we're witnessing here with the Cardinals. Tony, if I'm the Dodgers, I am so terrified of playing the Cardinals because, yes, the Dodgers are the better team by galaxies and leagues ahead, right? It's not close. I don't understand, though, and this is why it's terrifying. I don't understand how this is happening. I've asked baseball people, how is this happening? And they mention names like Lars Newtbar. Lars Newtbar, who is spelled <laughs> with two O's and two A's, is a player on the Cardinals. I did not know that guy existed. Adam Wainwright is one of two pitchers who's thrown more than 100 innings on the entire team. This is a team that we've ridiculed as recently as the trade deadline for going to get John Lester. And now Major League Baseball, Tony, they have to be terrified too. Because if the Dodgers get knocked off by a team that seemingly, cosmically, cannot lose at this point, then congratulations to a postseason that may be a lot less interesting without that team in it. I don't know how you could say that. If they go in winning 22 straight or, or you know, 21 yeah. of 22, that is a great storyline too. Israel, last word. Where my mind was going when I thought they've been doing this all season is Paul Goldschmidt. This should not be a surprise. He's been doing this for years and years. He's been 30 and 90 basically every year since his first All-Star game. You know, Arenado, 30 years old, came here 
for this. Now, Wainwright, I do have an affinity for 40-year-old professional athletes. 40 years old, yes, but he has done it before and with a 305. That's also my area code. Uh, for 305 uh, ERA, <laughs> like this guy is clearly not just a one. Can I ask about Goldsmith? Because I, I guess if we had a look at who was been carrying, I mean, Goldsmith's shoulders are broad and he's getting it done during this stretch. Yeah. Is anybody vaulting him up to MVP consideration over who you may have already had, a Tatis or a Harper, anybody? Anybody? That doesn't sound like anybody's I'm leading right now. All right. I'm dang Come good. back to me. Come back to me on Sunday if it's 22 straight. We'll move on. I told you, if it's the best strategy out there is to win out. But I also know what the worst strategy out there is in the postseason. Right? Pitching to Giancarlo Stan. That is the worst strategy. Boston did it, got swept. Toronto did it yesterday, got beat. Yankees finally with some breathing room, maybe for the playoffs. But I mean, they're the streakiest team out there. Who knows what the next four games could, or five games could, could lead to. Now Boston is losing to Baltimore, Toronto to New York, and the red hot Seattle Mariners trying to end the longest drought in the sport, shock the world, and get in with that win over Oakland last night. They won nine of ten. Pablo, what are we witnessing in the American League? We're watching the Yankees do the thing the Yankees do which is win a bunch of games in a row, but then also, terrifyingly for me, possibly lose a bunch of games, right? They win 13 in a row earlier in the season. They lose 11 of 13 right after that. Now they're on a good streak. That's great. But, Tony, this all feels like a prelude to what is actually possible here, a three-American League team tie for the wild card. That is possible. There would be a draft to decide it. I know the Yankees look good. I've seen this movie before. It feels like a season where that thing might actually happen. Justin Tinsley. We're witnessing complete and utter chaos. The Yankees have resurrected themselves for what feels like the 50th time this season. The Blue Jays are young. The Mariners are coming out of nowhere. And the Red Sox are collapsing just days before Tom Brady comes back to Boston. You would think Boston could close this out. They've got two against uh, Baltimore and then three against the Nationals to close it out. But I'm done predicting this. I'm watching the chaos. I love watching the fire burn. And if I'm Rob Manfred, I, this chaos is music to my ears. Keep it going. Yeah, the Yankees have a very Patriots-like do-your-job feel to them right now, and it feels like in the bullpen that's most obvious. And with Lou Severino, I think, is probably the biggest uh, example of that, coming in after all that time off and really solidifying that bullpen. They should be getting some more bullpen help with some health coming up. But even the story of Giancarlo Stanton, like, I love the idea that he has been, you know, ridiculed by Yankees fans for a couple of years and had everything you've heard uh, from a Yankees fan potentially, and now, when it matters most, at one of his, you know, incredible hot streaks, like, that all sort of vibe for the Yankees. I feel like that can continue. It's not even the first time he's done it for the franchise. I mean, last year in the postseason, he had six home yes. runs. Right. <laughs> Ramona Shelburne will bring you in here. Can I say a word for the West Coast? Yeah. Yeah. Do I have to be the bias? No, it's like, not a bias. The Mariners, the Mariners are. I mean, the Mariners are after St. Louis, the hottest team in baseball. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Like, at the beginning of the year, anytime somebody threw a no-hitter, we were like, oh, they must have played the Mariners because they couldn't hit. Yeah. I mean, it was this team is back in it. and they have What is it about this team right now and the run they're on that makes you think maybe they can break their drought? I, I think because there's absolutely no pressure on them. I mean, they were so bad at the beginning of the year, and they've gotten so much better. They have all this young talent that's sort of arrived on the scene, and they're all coming together right now. So I, I, the Yankees have a ton of pressure on the Red Sox. They weren't supposed to win this year, but they've been in the lead here. So I, I like the I like the young teams. I like the Blue Jays and the Mariners to come out of this. And I also built for chaos. Oh, everybody! Five team tie. Every Let's have a whole bunch of play-in games. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. If you like chaos, what, what, what's happening right now? I have no idea what's happening. What's happening? What's ah! happening? Fights everywhere. Oh, where did that ball come from? Sorry about that, Pablo. Sky Sun last oh, night. No. Send the game directly to Springfield. What Candace Barker did. What Courtney Vandersloot did to go into John Quell Jones's house on the day she won MVP and, and played like she won MVP. Van der Sloot, the second triple-double in playoff history, the thrilling double overtime win in game one. Israel, what's your takeaway from a game one like that? MVP, what most improved, wasn't coach of the year also from this same yeah, Connecticut yeah. team. Uh, my takeaway is it might be a bad matchup for Connecticut. I mean, there's only a couple of times this year where they've given up 50, more, 50 or more points and a half. It's been both times to this Chicago team. And you look at Vandersloot, like, there's a couple of all WNBA, a first and second team, all defensive players on that squad. They have no answer for Vandersloot or, uh, or that offense in general. And it just becomes from, from brains. It's Vandersloot's ability to see the game. It's Candace Parker, obviously a very smart player. And yeah, they seem to have uh, Connecticut's number right now, so it's a pretty shaky start. Ramona Shelburne. 
That was one of the best games I've seen all year, the double overtime game. And even uh, so many of those plays, Breon January th throwing up the three and getting the foul on Parker. I mean, Candace Parker played 39 minutes last night. 39 minutes. I mean, she's the elder stateswoman on this team. Came, at, came left, left L.A. where she'd played her whole career, joined Chicago to be the missing piece on that team. The whole first month of the season, it didn't look like they were going to come together because they were all hurt. But they are a very dangerous six-seeded team. And I, I think if you're Connecticut, when you talk about disrespect and they do the CT, disrespect, okay, you're the number one seed, came in with 14 straight wins, your MVP night, and then you lose the first one at home? Yeah. That's a tough one. Yeah, we just talked about in baseball, the hottest team going in. Well, Connecticut was on such a great run to lose game one like that at home, Pablo Torre. Yeah, look, Courtney Vandersloot, the triple-double, I want to focus on that here, Tony, because I know she's the first one to do it since Cheryl Swoops did it a bunch of years ago. Very impressive, but it obscures what she did in her 44 minutes at point guard in this game because she had 18 assists. This is the player who has led the WNBA five of the last six years in assists. She has the all-time assist record. Having someone to steer the ship in the middle of all of that chaos, that to me is the thing we should be focusing on too. Yeah, if I'm the Sun, I wouldn't panic. This is their first loss since August and only their sec second home loss of the season. They had a lot... They had a lot of self-induced mistakes last night. They were 22 at 31 from the line. They missed a couple of down the stretch. John Quo Jones, she she played out of her mind. She just needs more help moving forward. But this Sky team with Candace Parker, she looks like she's on a mission. And they're a completely different team with her. They're one and eight without her and 18 and eight with her. This is this is a team on a mission that she looks like. Last word is Rick Gutierrez. Yeah, it does set up sort of for Jonquil Jones, though, when you look at sort of her ascent in the WNBA from most improved to, to MVP. Now she gets her award, but she's got to play like an MVP for the rest of this season, uh, for the rest of this series to really pull it out. Buy or sell is next. Ramona, Israel, Justin, do me a favor real quick. Can you just look into the camera, alternate nod and laugh? <laughs> for me, can you just do I want to see what you're bringing with here. I, I want to see something. Let me, let me just put this down here. Oh, oh, yes. Oh, Wasn't oh, that funny? Oh, Lying yeah. for now I win win the face. Laugh. I Lying thanks, at work. thanks for hosting the doc on PTI. We'll be back. Buy yourself. Seven combined seasons of NBA basketball right there. <laughs> LeBron, um, at Media Day yesterday, is optimistic about this season. He's indicating they're excited. Quote, we're excited. End quote. No, we're excited. <laughs> Ramona, buy or sell this year's Lakers team being better than last year's Lakers team and back to being finals favorite. That was a great cut of the quote there. Uh, yeah, I, I'm buying the happy talk because it, it's almost like I closed my eyes and last year didn't happen. Dwight Howard was there, Rondo, Rondo was there, LeBron's there. And, and they all have the same motivation that they did before that 2020 season where LeBron had missed the playoffs, coming off a bad injury, Anthony Davis had to prove himself. It's like we just closed our eyes and the last year didn't happen. Okay. So I'm buying it. They're in a good headspace. Israel? Oh, if the Lakers close their eyes, they might fall asleep because they're old and they're tired. <laughs> but I do think in a media day situation, I think they, there's probably that, no other team in the league outside of maybe a super team or a Steph Curry-led team that has high hopes on media day. And obviously with that roster and obviously with that experience and the motivation, it's going to be a good day for the league. Ooh. So yeah, I, I, I'm supporting everything that they say. It is a good day for Israel Gutierrez <laughs> right now. It's Justin Tinsley. <laughs> Yeah, everyone knows the Lakers are old, even the Lakers, so they're going to play very hard and get, give you hard candies on the way out the door because that's just who they are. And I also like to call them the Cigar Club Lakers because that's who they are. Uh, but look, they know what's at stake here. They know they don't they don't have that many more opportunities uh, in comparison to the one that's in front of them right now. And everybody knows that team revolves around Bron, AD, and Russ, and everyone, everyone will fill in around them. So I'm not worried about the Lakers. The pressure's really on Vogel, the coaching, and the training staff to just manage that team and get them to the playoffs as, as healthy as possible. And Pablo Torre. Look, Tony, this team was constructed to win the press conference, and they have done that already. Congratulations. Huge names, people who are meme-ready, LeBron James seemingly healthy, which is the big reason the Lakers weren't in contention last year. Was there anything else but LeBron not being whole? And the fact that LeBron is whole means optimism is deserved. But the real reason for optimism, Tony, also, the Nets are the other team we've considered title favorites, and if Kyrie Irving can't play half his games, then yes, it absolutely should be the Lakers because that's another All right, gift. So you've got the Lakers as title favorites. Justin, title favorites? Absolutely. Israel? 
Ramona? Yes. Wow, everybody's got it. I, I knew everyone for the Milwaukee Bucks, just for you saying that. We move on. Pelicans Media Day. Look at Zion Williamson here. Feel the excitement and love from Zion Williamson. Oh, I just want to wrap myself in this. But here's what we learned this week. He had surgery on his foot, his fifth metatarsal this offseason. It, it, it just became public this week. He's expected to be ready for the opener, but it did lead to some questions about his health and the long-term impact of impact on his body. Israel, concern doesn't jive with that smile we're looking at right here, but buy yourself concern for Zion. Wait a second. Did Justin wear the two chains because he knew we were going to show Zion wearing the exact same <laughs> It is a chain. phenomenal look. Wait a minute. <laughs> that, um, <laughs> you know, I, I can see it look, now. Peace I think the way you train these days... Yeah, the way you train these days, you can train to avoid injuries, you can train very specifically, and you can predict injuries. Zion Williamson, I've talked to a couple people, looks like a walking injury. And so I don't know whose fault it is, whether it be the trainers that are currently there, whether it be the trainers that he's working with, or maybe he's not working hard enough. But there's not, there's something there to him continuously getting hurt. You can train differently and not get hurt. Justin? Yeah, but there's an obvious concern here. Zion's putting up 26 points on 60% shooting in the league, but he's been injury prone the entire time. For Zion Williamson, there's a massive contract waiting on you. And the title of injury prone, you don't want that because that can cost you a lot, of, a lot of money down the road. But sometimes injury prone are just words, right? Joel Embiid missed how much of his first couple of seasons, and now he is, you first know, two years. yeah, first two years. Uh, Pablo, this particular hearing surgery this week, this particular injury concern. Yeah, this is the third injury to that same leg, I believe, in his career. This is somebody, Tony, who jumps and lands. Like, that's his game, jumping and landing, then jumping again. Like, this is the last sort of injury that I want. What I'm most impressed by by this injury, of course, is the fact that this didn't leak out till, like, this week. I'm astonished okay. that a Zion Williamson foot breaking, breaking is not something we heard about before. Well, maybe not. we didn't hear about it. I'm sure Ramona knew about this. No, really, I didn't. Oh. <laughs> like, that's what we were all like. We saw the tweets. Ah. Like, did, did Andrew Lopez, who covers him, did he get hacked? What? I'm sorry, what was okay. that quote? Like, that was yeah. a very well-kept secret down there. And I, look, this is in a very important year. Because Justin, I don't, think, I don't think he's worried about that money. He gets it no matter what. I don't care how injury-prone he is. He's so good, they got to give him the money. The question is, will he be the first player to turn down a qualifying offer? If he's not happy in the world, like, like that team needs to win this year. They need to show some progress, and he's got to be on the court for them to do it. That'll get you some points, Ramona, but not enough. You ran into a Gutierrez Tinsley. Let, let's just take it, take it in right now. Tinsley, this look, peace and love, peace and love. I mean, it's the best sweater ever worn on the show. I think there's no question about that. All right. It's Pablo and I showed up. A person who's played Drake on the show, Israel, right? And you played Bieber for us versus Two Chains in Showdown. <laughs> Josh Gordon, the receiver this week, he's completed his sixth suspension with the league this summer. Tampa Bay signing Richard Sherman two and a half months after his arrest at his in law's home under suspicion of malicious mischief with domestic violence designation and a DUI charge. There's a pretrial hearing for Sherman's Friday this week in the state of Washington. On the football field or off the football field, Israel, you can talk about anything you like here. What do you think of these two moves? Well, I've convinced myself long ago that Josh Gordon's comeback is something I would not believe in. But this time, maybe with Patrick Mahomes, and they need a little help. Almost 60% of their targets going to either Hill or Kelsey need a little help over there. Justin? Yeah, his legal situation notwithstanding, I think Richard Sherman can really help this Bucks team in an area where they actually need it. And I th in comparison to Josh Gordon, I think Sherman can get himself in the game shape, both physically and mentally, a lot quicker. He has played football more recently. And does Kansas City need help on the other side of the ball more than they need offensively? We'll move on. From over the weekend, SMU beating Debatable. TCU. This game was at TCU, so SMU stormed the field to plant their flag. TCU kind of resisted that. There was a fracas, assistant coach for TCU, Jerry Kill was knocked over and concussed. After that, TCU head coach Gary Patterson was very heated about it all. Video review shows no proof of any SMU member contacting Kill there. And then SMU tweeted out TCU's uh, COVID song, uh, Gary Patterson singing it. And that kind of got a remix and got Patterson worked up as well. Whose side are you on here, Justin, throughout all of this? I don't want anybody to get hurt, but I'm on the side of the flag planters. Look, if you don't want them planting the flag, you better beat them. And if anything, it just gives them anticipation for next year's game. Israel? 
Well, that's the thing. Don't take it too seriously. Don't get that angry to where you're running out in the field and potentially getting hurt. If the team does that, let them do that. They did their work in the game. Justin Tinsley looking good today and looking good in FaceTime. Uh, thank you so much. I just want to shout out my, one of my best friends, Vaughn Moss. He created this shirt that I'm wearing right here, Peace and Love. And it's also to bring uh, awareness to Bre Breast Cancer Awareness Month, which is in October. So I want to tell everybody uh, to go get their annual physicals, get tested. Health is wealth, and we need everybody here. So peace and love to everybody. It is a great look for you, Justin. That's to your Thank friends you, man. family. We're on a 23 and a half hour break. See you guys tomorrow around the horn.